So now we come to chapter 11, or as I prefer, chapter 12, which is called Vision of the Universe Abirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya. And I just want to say a few things about Akshobhya and Abirati. Abirati, even in the name, is to the east, whereas, you know, Sukhavati is to the west. You know, of Buddha Amitabha, Sukhavati is to the west, right? And uh, Sukha is kind of like more beatific type bliss. It, of course, is orgasmic, but it's beyond ordinary orgasm in that it's inexhaustible and it never ends. So it's infinite orgasm in that sense, different from finite orgasm. <laughs> and, and so really there's no difference in the Buddha verses they're saying, but there's a little difference in that the Sukhavati one is more like a celestial heavenly one, like indeed the universe we saw in the last chapter of Sarvaganda Suganda, in the last two chapters. You know, the one that's made of incense and everybody's body is incense and the land and the trees and the streets and the houses and everybody's incense. And uh, so it's a pure perfume universe. And there are those where it's all pure light and it's all pure music or whatever. You know, there's all these different kinds they mention in that one. Okay. Whereas Abhinati, the rati sound, is a kind of bliss, but it's more earthy type of bliss. It's more, more kind of uh, related, orgasmic in a more earthy way, let's say. And it's where all the mahasiddhas, you know, the lay enlightened people, like uh, Virupa, you know, of, of Gandapa, of Naropa, Tilupa, these kind of people, the great Indian mahasiddhas, the non-dual ones. And of course, in Tibet, you have Milarepa, and, and you have uh, all the great Nyingma siddhas, and, and also not necessarily, man you have also monastic siddhas or mendicant siddhas, but, but mostly lay people. And um, so there's a kind of a little more male-female element, you would think, in Rati. And Rati is the name of the wife of Cupid, who is one of the four devils, actually, but who is actually a bodhisattva, too, in the non-dual level. <laughs> Mara, the Mara of passion, you know. And uh, so his wife's name is Rati, you know. And uh, so it's that kind of bliss associated with passion. And then Akshobhya is the, always the central, but the Akshobhya, the unbudgeable, you know, the... the immovable one, can't be chubbed, it can't be sh shaken, the unshakable. And uh, uh, it sounds like akshobya, unshakable, yeah, very similar. And uh, he's always in the center of the unexcelled yoga tantra mandalas. And Vairochana, who's the, the Buddha of form, is, is always in the eastern gate, you know, the eastern side, you know. Whereas in the lesser tantras, the yoga tantras and so on, Vairochana is often in the center. So, so, so again, Akshobhya, and Akshobhya represents the ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom, which is the transmutation of the passion or the addiction of hate, hatred, because hatred is connected, wants to take everything to pieces, you know, wants to destroy, is destructive. And so, and in a way, intellectual analysis is destructive in that it wants to dissect everything to see how it's made, what its reality is. And so it will destroy something to understand it, you know. And that and hatred turns into intelligence. So when you destroy everything, you discover that what's left is infinite joy and infinite energy and infinite life and clear light and the nirvana and so on, you know, non-dual Buddhahood and infinite Buddha presence, you know, all good, in other words. So that hatred is then transmuted into having discovered ultimate reality perfection. So I just want to say that. That is connected to Buddha Akshobhya and therefore his pure land Abhirati. So it's kind of a good one. And, and, you know, for example, in Milarepa's autobiography, it is obtained by his disciple Rechungba, who develops the ability to travel uh, within a subtle body, magic body, illusory body, and goes to the Abhirati universe and finds Milarepa there after Milarepa had left his Milarepa body, and then asks him to tell his life story, which Milarepa does. But he's living in Abhirati. That's where he finds him. So it has this kind of context in the, cosmo in the astrophysics or cosmology of the uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhism, Indian and Indo-Tibetan Mahayana Buddhism, and Chinese and Japanese and Korean and Vietnamese, etc. 
although they don't have the fullest version of the Indian one. Tibet has the full, Tibet and Mongolia have the fullest one. So, uh, so that I wanted to say in this chapter, beginning this chapter, and then I will read. Okay. Sorry, cut this. <laughs> I'm like that because of my feet are getting cold because of the temperature in here, which is fine. Never mind. Thereupon the Buddha said to the Lichavi Vimalakirti, Noble son, what when you would see the Tathagata, how do you view him? So this is the Buddha is the Tathagata, and he's talking to Vimalakirti standing in front of him or sitting in front of him. So you would see the Tathagata, how do you view him? You're referring to himself in the third person. This is a very Zen encounter. Thus addressed, the Lichami Vimalakirti said to the Buddha, Lord, when I would see the Tathagata, I view him by not seeing any Tathagata. Why? I see him as not born from the past, not passing on to the future, and not abiding in the present time. So with you here in the moment in front of me are not all of you, in other words. I don't see you as you in the moment here. I see you in all the past and all the future. Why? He is the essence that is the reality of matter, but he is not matter. He is the essence that is the reality of sensation, but he is not sensation. He is the essence that is the reality of intellect, but he is not intellect. She is the essence that is the reality of performance, yet she is not performance. She is the essence that is the reality of consciousness, yet he is not consciousness. Like the element of space, he does not rest, abide in any of the four elements. Like transcending the scope of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, she is not produced in the six sense media. She is not involved in the three worlds, is free of the three defilements, is associated with the triple liberation, is endowed with the three knowledges, and has truly attained the unattainable. The Tathagata has reached the extreme of detachment in regard to all things, yet he is not a reality limit. He abides in ultimate reality, yet there is no relationship between it and him. In that sense, he is it, okay? but you can just say he abides, in other words, that means, right? Each, in each one of these sentences that I read, you can unpack like that. He is not produced from causes, nor does he depend on conditions, because he's uncreated, of course. He is not, he was, that's like clear light, like reality, it's, he is reality itself, not produced from causes, nor depend on conditions. He is not without any characteristic, nor has he any characteristic. He doesn't lack them, nor does he have any. He has no single nature, nor any diversity of natures. He is not a conception, nor a mental construction, nor is he a non-conception. He is neither the other shore, nor this shore, nor that between. He is neither here, nor there, nor anywhere else. He is neither this, nor that. He cannot be discovered by consciousness, nor is she inherent in consciousness. She is neither darkness, nor light. She is neither name nor sign. She is neither weak nor strong. She lives in no country or direction. She is neither good nor evil. He is neither compounded nor uncompounded. He cannot be explained as having any meaning whatsoever. <clears throat> and by the way, in a proper translation, because in the Sanskrit, the male nominal ending is said by rules of grammar to include the female like the word mankind in English, is supposed to include women, women, not just men, males. But in English, he does not include she, whereas she includes he. So when he refers to Tathagata in this more absolute level, more uncreated level of the, fine, of the true Dharmakaya level, the reality body level, it should preferably be she than he, because she contains he. S-H-E. That's a he, and the s in front makes it a she. So I'm going to retranslate this. My final version will have she in all of this passage. Okay? As I read it, I alternated. <laughs> uh, because in the chauvinist cultural context of ancient India, where the Mahayana is being enacted in this time and case, they are saying he, 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 he about the Buddha. The Tathagata is neither generosity nor avarice, 
neither morality nor immorality, neither tolerance nor malice, neither effort nor sloth, neither concentration nor distraction, neither wisdom nor foolishness. He is inexpressible. He is neither truth nor falsehood, neither escape from the world nor failure to escape from the world, neither cause of involvement in the world nor not a cause of involvement in the world. He is the cessation of all theory and all practice. He is neither a field of merit nor not a field of merit. He is neither worthy of offerings nor unworthy of offerings. He is not an object and cannot be contacted. He is not a whole nor because you are. He is all fused with you. So you can't contact him as something other than you. He's not a whole nor a conglomeration. He surpasses all calculations. He is utterly unequal, yet equal to the ultimate reality of things. He is matchless, especially in effort. He surpasses all measure. He does not go, does not stay, does not pass beyond. She is neither seen, heard, distinguished, nor known. She is without any complexity, having attained the equanimity of omniscient gnostic intuition. She is equal toward all things. She does not discriminate between them. She is without reproach, without excess, without corruption, without conception, and without intellectualization. She is without activity, without birth, without occurrence, without origin, without production, and without non-production. She is without fear and without subconsciousness, without sorrow, without joy, and without strain. No verbal teaching can express him or her. Such is the body of the Tathagata, and thus should she be seen who sees thus truly sees, who sees otherwise sees falsely. The Venerable Shad, it's kind of a last word where standing in front of the physical representation of the unexcelled incarnation body, you know, the, the, the Parama Nirmanakaya, the unexcelled emanation body, which is Shakyamuni in this context, he says, I don't see him by seeing you. I don't see her by seeing you, he says, meaning you are everything, including me, and that is inexpressible. The Venerable Shari, so it's kind of a final statement in a way. The Venerable Shari Putra then asked the Buddha, Lord, always looking for context, Shari Putra, in which Buddha verse did the noble Vimalakirti die? before reincarnating in this Buddha-verse. The Buddha said, Shariputra asked this good man directly where he died to reincarnate here. Although Shariputra is, of course, assuming that in order to have another body, you have to die in the previous body. So you migrate by dying and being reborn. Or be, and, and instant, you can be reborn by apparition, so it could be instantaneous. You don't have to, you don't have to grow up and do all that, actually if you have truly supernormal abilities. And uh, so, so he's trying to find a context, Shariputra. And the Buddha said, Shariputra asked this good man directly where he died to reincarnate here. Then the Venerable Shariputra asked the Lichabha Vimalakirti, A noble sir, where did you die to reincarnate here? And Vimalakirti declared, he has to always give him a hard time, is there anything among the things that you see, Elder, that dies or is reborn? Because he's glimpsed nirvana, Shariputra, he knows that. Shariputra, what makes him a disciple still is, he's done, is he didn't cultivate the compassion to the degree. He didn't understand it with the body. He does understand it with the mind. Shariputra says, there is nothing that dies or is reborn. Yeah, no one. Likewise, Reverend Shariputra, as all things neither die nor are reborn, why do you ask? Where did you die to reincarnate here? Reverend Shariputra, if one were to ask a man or woman created by a magician where he or she had died to reincarnate there, what do you think he or she would answer? Noble sir, a magical creation does not die, nor is it reborn. Vimalakirti Reverend Shariputra did not the Tathagata declare that all things have the nature of a magical creation. Just the same place where the goddess worked reached with Shariputra. Shariputra, yes, noble sir, that is indeed so. Reverend Shariputra, since all things have the nature of a magical creation, why do you ask, where have you died to reincarnate here? 
Reverend Shariputra, death is an end of performance and rebirth is the continuation of performance. But although a Bodhisattva dies, he does not put an end to the performance of the roots of virtue. And although she is reborn, she does not adhere to the continuation of sin. So, in other words, it's all good. There is no death. You know, I'm here. I didn't die to get here. And so on. Then the Buddha said to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, this holy person came here from the presence of the Tathagata Akshobhya in the universe Abhirati. Ah, then now Shariputra can locate him. Lord, our blessed one, it is wonderful that this holy person, having left a Buddha field, Buddha verse as pure as Abhirati, should enjoy a Buddha field, a Buddha verse, a Buddha land as full of defects as this Saha universe. The Lichavi Vimalakirti said, Shariputra, what do you think? Does the light of the sun accompany darkness? Shariputra, certainly not, noble sir. Shri then the two do not go together? Shariputra, noble sir, those two do not go together. As soon as the sun rises, all darkness is destroyed. Vimalakirti, then why does the sun rise over the world? Shariputra, it rises to illuminate the world and to eliminate the darkness. Vimalakirti, just in the same way, Reverend Shariputra, the Bodhisattva reincarnates voluntarily in the impure Buddha fields, Buddha verses, in order to purify the living beings, in order to make the light of wisdom shine, and in order to clear away the darkness. Since they do not associate with the addictions, they dispel the darkness of the addictions of all living beings, implying we here are now in the Buddha field of Shakyamuni Buddha, still, now supposedly 2,500 years later, but we're still here now, and therefore there's no problem now. We're in the Buddha field, we're in the Buddhaverse. There is no darkness of addictions. There's no impurity here, really. He's saying, very challenging, eh. but a very tantric vision, actually, in li using liberative art inconceivably to take the seeming lack of nirvana as the proof of nirvana being nirvana. <laughs> Thereupon, I will unpack. Thereupon, the entire multitude experienced the desire to behold the universe Abhirati, the Tathagata Akshobhya, his bodhisattvas, and his great disciples. The Buddha, knowing the thoughts of the entire multitude, said to the Lichavi Vimalakirti, Noble son, this multitude wishes to behold the universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya Please show them. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti thought, without rising from my couch, I shall, oh, I see Vimalakirti came to see Shakyamuni picking up the huge assembly without leaving his couch. <laughs> this is really special. He didn't leave it. Very good, Lichavi Vimalakirti. Without rising from my couch, I shall pick up in my right hand the universe Abhirati and all it contains, its hundreds of thousands of bodhisattvas, its abodes of gods, dragons, goblins, fairies, and anti-gods, bounded by its Chakravada mountains, its rivers, lakes, fountains, streams, oceans, and other bodies of water, its Mount Meru and other hills and mountain ranges, its moon, its sun and its stars, its, the, its gods, dragons, goblins, fairies and anti-gods themselves, its Brahma, the supreme deity and his retinues, its villages, cities, towns, provinces, kingdoms, men, women, and how men, women, and houses, its bodhisattvas, its disciples, the tree of enlightenment of the Tathagata Akshobhya, and the Tathagata Akshobhya himself, seated in the middle of an assembly vast as an ocean teaching the Dharma. Also the lotuses that accomplish the Buddha work among the living beings, the three jewel ladders that rise from its earth to its 33 heaven, on which ladders the gods of that heaven descend to the world to see, honor, and serve the Tathagata Akshobhya, and to hear the Dharma, and on which the men and women of the earth climb to the Triastrimsha heaven to visit those gods. 
like a pot, like a potter, you know, because in Abirati, therefore, the first, the le that level of desire realm, heaven, the Olympus, where Indra and Buddha's mother and other gods live, you know, Ganesha, the, they're all living there, you know, the Maruts, Mitra, you know, all the Olympian gods live there. And they, and they come down because Akshobhya stays on the human plane always. And the humans can go up and take a break in those desire realm heavens. And, it's, and they're connected by this giant escalator <laughs> all the time. That's one of the differences. But otherwise, Abhinata is more humanoid. There's animals and so forth. It isn't just like magic garden like Sukhavati. Okay? So it's more humanoid place. So I will visit those gods. Like a potter with his wheel, I will reduce that universe, Abhirati, with its store of immeasurable virtues from its watery base up to its Akanista heaven to a minute size and carrying it gently like a garland of flowers will bring it to this Saha universe and will show it to the multitudes. Then the Litabha Vimalakirti entered into a concentration and performed a Samadhi, that is, and performed a miraculous feat such that he reduced the universe Abhirati to a minute size, like almost like a, like a grapefruit or something, and took it with his right hand and brought it into this Saha universe. In that universe Abhirati, the disciples, Bodhisattvas, and those among the gods and humans who possess the super knowledge of the divine eye all cried out, Lord, we are being carried away. Sugata, we are being carried off. Protect us, O Tathagata. But to discipline them and educate them, the Tathagata Akshobhya said to them, You are being carried off by the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti. It's not my affair. As for the other humans and gods, they had no awareness at all that they were being carried anywhere, even though they're being miniaturized and all these things are happening to them. <laughs> Because this is illusion-like relative reality to an enlightened being. It's like a virtual a VR. It's a VR experience. They can shrink these dimensions like that. Although the universe Abhinati had been brought into the universe Saha, the Saha universe was not increased or diminished. It was neither compressed nor obstructed. Nor was the universe Abhinati reduced internally. And both universes appeared to be the same as they had ever been. Thereupon the Buddha Shakyamuni asked all the multitudes, Friends, behold the splendors of the universe Abhinati, the Tathagata Akshobhya, the array of his Buddha field, a Buddha verse, a Buddha land, and the splendors of these disciples and Bodhisattvas. They replied, We see them, O blessed Lord. The Buddha said, Those Bodhisattvas who wish to embrace such a Buddha verse, should educate themselves in all the bodhisattva practices of the Tathagata Akshobhya. While Vimalakirti, with his miraculous powers, showed them thus the universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya, 140,000 living beings among the humans and gods of the Saha universe conceived the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment, and all of them, that is to say, decided they too were going to be bodhisattvas for the sake of all beings, and we're going to be Buddhas for the sake of all beings, so they became Bodhisattvas. And all of them formed a prayer to be reborn in the universe Abhirati. And the Buddha prophesied that in the future all would be reborn in the universe Abhirati. And the Lichavi Vimalakirti, having thus developed all the living beings who could thereby be developed, returned the universe Abhirati exactly to its former place. The Lord then said to the venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, did you see that universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya? Shariputra replied, I saw it, O blessed Lord, O blessed one. May all living beings come to live in a Buddha field as splendid as that. May all living beings come to have miraculous powers just like those of the noble Lichabha Vimalakirti. We have gained great benefit from having seen a holy man such as he. We have gained a great benefit from having heard such a teaching of the Dharma, whether the Tathagata himself still actually exists, or whether he has already attained ultimate liberation. Hence there is no need to mention the great benefit for those who, having heard it, believe it, rely on it, embrace it, remember it, read it, and penetrate to its depth, and having found faith in it, teach, recite, and show it to others, and apply themselves to the yoga 
of meditation upon its teaching. Those living beings who understand correctly the teaching of the Dharma will obtain the treasury of the jewels of the Dharma. Those who study correctly this teaching of the Dharma will become the companions of the Tathagata. Those who honor and serve the adepts of this teaching will be the true protectors of the Dharma. Those who write, teach, and worship this teaching of the Dharma will be visited by the Tathagata in their homes. Those who take pleasure in this teaching of the Dharma will embrace all merits. Those who teach it to others, whether it be no more than a single stanza of four lines or a single summary phrase from this teaching of the Dharma, will be performing the great Dharma sacrifice. And those who devote this to this teaching of the Dharma, their tolerance, their zeal, their intelligence, their discernment, their vision, and their aspirations, thereby become subject to the prophecy of future Buddhahood. End of chapter. Now then there is, a, there is kind of what I took as an epilogue, and as a chapter 13. In this book is version, and in some of them it's chapter 12, but I still like better as chapter 13, and I'm going to keep it like that. And it's called Antecedents and Transmission of the Holy Dharma. Uh, then Chakra, the king of the gods, that's Indra, king of the gods of the desire realm, of connected to the human realm, like the Olympus of ancient Indian astrophysics, astrophysical cosmology. Why do I say astrophysical cosmology? One thing all throughout the Vimalakirti or, or the uh, fl flower ornament or any Mahayana Sutra, and even in the Theravada thing, if they really would focus on the astrophysical cosmological element, how to fit in the Mount Sumeru cosmology, you know, the billion world galaxy uh, model, model, the three realm of desire, form, and formlessness models, how these fit together is really hard to deal with. Connect it, since we want to connect it to the model that we have today of the solar system in the galaxy, of the galaxy in the nebula, the nebula in the universe, and like the more enlightened scientists are aware that the universe is a multiverse because there are different orders of space and time and so on. But the more pedestrian ones, they think, oh, it's, a, it's, in, it's not infinite, it's limited, because after a certain distance we can't see anything, so it's dark, so there must not be anything. Who, therefore, the people who are running around ignorantly and insanely reifying nothingness into something. <clears throat> but still, how to fit those together, and therefore how to translate these things to fit together in this cosmology based on an infiniverse. Not a universe, but an infiniverse, or a Buddhaverse, which is a Buddhaverse, okay? Within which there are specific Buddha lands, maybe. But it's all the same kshetra, it's a field, it's an infinite field or, or, or a, 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 a illusorily, magically defined, finite field like Sukhavati or... But they're not really finite, so they're not really that way. So. It's very hard to connect it, okay? So the only way to do it is to play with it and also don't get stuck on your vision, which is kind of crazy anyway. You know, there's this one thing that just I want to say to those who think, oh, wow, they're so ignorant, they didn't know exactly we're on this planet and, you know, there's a model of us down there in the Rose Planetarium where you have the sun in the middle and the planets are orbiting around. But that's a fake model also. That's fake. Why? Because the... Galaxy itself is going one million miles per hour through the rotation of the Milky Way galaxy. It's so fast. It's, the dimensions are so huge. The sun within the galaxy is going uh, 155,000 miles an hour. The Earth in orbit around the sun is going 66,000 miles an hour. We on the surface of the Earth, if we were at the equator, are, are rotating around 1,000 miles an hour to get around in 24 hours, you know. So we're kind of ribbons shooting through the universe from a further away perspective, if you can imagine it. So, and our, you know, our atoms are not solid. They're all they're tiny. We have like less than, all the atoms in our body would be less than a grain of sand in size. And mostly we're empty space, you know. So, you know, all of our sense of being locked into certain false confidence in the apparent solidity of the realm we think we're walking around in is pure mental construction. It's a pure collective 
enterprise of constructing it like that. And it's, it's, used, it's been useful by scientists of seeing this thing in the solar system and et cetera. But don't be stuck on it as if it was ultimate reality, because it isn't. It's a, it's a construction. It's a useful fiction overlaid. It's a kind of magic, actually, overlaid on us to make us feel we're spinning and to dethrone us from our arrogance of previous world system and so forth. And other cultures didn't have such a, you know, Terra-centric sort of thing in the past as we do and so on. Okay? So actually, if you try to really locate yourself in some sort of ultimate context, you will get lost in space. That's the point. Then Chakra, Indra, the king of the gods, said to the Buddha, Blessed what formerly I have heard from the Tathagata and from Manjushri, the crown prince of wisdom, many hundreds of thousands of teaching of the Dharma, but I have never before heard a teaching of the Dharma as remarkable as this instruction in the entrance into the method of inconceivable transformations. Just like, you know, he would have said this, he would say, and he did say the same thing about the flower ornament, because this Vimalakirti is a drop of the ocean of that, remember, that's why we're recording them together, you know. But this one is sort of more accessible, more short and small, it's only a hundred pages in English and so on. Blessed one, those living beings who having heard this teaching of the Dharma, accept it, remember it, read it, and understand it deeply. And they will be, without a doubt, true vessels of the Dharma. There is no need to mention those who apply themselves to the yoga of meditation upon it, upon the inconceivable liberation. They will cut off all possibility of unhappy lives. They'll never have an unhappy life. No one will who really gets into it will open their way to all fortunate lives, will always be looked after by all Buddhas, will always overcome all adversities, and will always conquer all devils. They will practice the path of the Bodhisattvas, will take their places upon the seat of enlightenment, and will have truly entered the domain of the Tathagatas. Blessed One, the noble sons and daughters who will teach and practice these, this exposition of the Dharma will be honored and served by me and my followers. That's the Zeus, you know, the Olympian gods. To the villages, towns, cities, states, kingdoms, and capitals wherein this teaching of the Dharma will be applied, taught, and demonstrated, I and my followers will come to hear the Dharma. I will inspire the unbelieving with faith, and I will guarantee my help and protection to those who believe and uphold the Dharma. At these words, the Buddha said to Chakra Indra, the king of the gods, Excellent, excellent king of gods, the Tathagata rejoices in your good words. King of gods, the enlightenment of the Buddhas of past, present, and future is expressed in this discourse of the Dharma. Therefore, king of gods, when noble sons and daughters accept it, repeat it, understand it deeply, write it completely, and making it into a book, honor it, those sons and daughters thereby pay homage to the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. Let us suppose, King of Gods, that this billion-world galactic universe were as full of Tathagatas as it is covered with groves of sugar cane, with rose bushes, with bamboo thickets, with sesame gardens, with flowers, and that a noble son or daughter were to honor them, revere them, respect and adore them, offering them all sorts of comforts and offerings for an eon or more than an eon. And let us suppose that these Tathagatas, having entered ultimate liberation, he or she honored each of them by enshrining their preserved bodies in a memorial stupa made of precious stones, each as large as a world with four great continents, rising as high as the world of Brahma, adorned with parasols, banners, standards, and lamps. And let us suppose finally that having erected all these stupas for the Tathagatas, he or she were to devote an aeon or more to offering them flowers, perfumes, banners, and standards while playing drums and music. That being done, what do you think, King of Gods? Would that noble son or daughter receive much merit as a consequence of such activities? Chakra Indra, the King of the Gods, replied, Many merits, Lord, many, O oh, blessed one, many merits, O oh, Sugata, blissful one. Were one to spend hundreds of thousands of millions of aeons, it would be impossible to measure the limit of the mass of merits that that some noble son or daughter would thereby gather. The Buddha said, Have faith, king of gods, 
and understand this. Whoever accepts this exposition of the Dharma called Instruction in the Inconceivable Liberation, that's the, one of the other titles of the Vimalakirti, recites it and understands it deeply, he or she will gather merits even greater than those who perform the, the above acts. Why so? Because, King of Gods, the enlightenment of the Buddha arises from the Dharma, and one honors them by the Dharma worship and not by material worship. Thus it is taught, Thus it is taught, King of Gods, and thus you must understand it. The Buddha then further said to Chakra, King of the Gods, Once, King of the Gods, long ago, long before aeons more numerous than the innumerable, immense, immeasurable, inconceivable, and even before then, the Tathagata called Bhaisajaraja, King of Medicine. <laughs> That's Menla, Bhaisaja. Bhaisajaraja appeared in the world as an arhat, perfectly and fully enlightened, endowed with knowledge and conduct, a blissful one, knower of the world, incomparable knower of humans who need to be civilized, teacher of gods and humans, a lord, a blissful lord, a Buddha. He appeared in the aeon called Vicharana, in the universe called Mahavyuha, the great array, and in aeon was Vicharana, which means the examined, the thoroughly analyzed. <laughs> And the length of life of this perfectly and fully enlightened Tathagata by Shajaraja was 20 short aeons. His retinue of disciples numbered 36 million billion, and his retinue of bodhisattvas numbered 12 million billion. In that same era, King of Gods, there was a universal monarch called King Ratna Chatra, the jewel parasol, who reigned jewel umbrella, who reigned over the four continents and possessed seven precious jewels. He had 1,000 heroic sons, powerful, strong, and able to conquer enemy armies. This King Ratna Chatra honored the Tathagata by Shadjaraja and his retinue with many excellent offerings during five short aeons. At the end of this time, the King Ratna Chatra said to his sons, Recognizing that during my reign I have worshipped the Tathagata, in your turn you should also worship him. The 10,000 princes gave their consent, obeying their father, the king, and altogether during another five short aeons, they honored the Tathagata by Shadjaraja with all sorts of excellent offerings. Among them, there was a prince by name of Chandra Chatra, which means moon umbrella, which actually is the same name as the king of Vaishali, who retired into, so I just noticed, who retired into solitude and thought to himself, is there not another mode of worship, even better and more noble than this? Then by the supernatural power of the Buddha, by Shajaraja, the gods spoke to him from the heavens, Good man, the supreme worship is the Dharma worship. Chandrachata asked them, What is this Dharma worship? The gods replied, Human, a good man, go to the Tathagata by Shajaraja, ask him about the Dharma worship, and he will explain it to you fully. Then the prince Chandrachatra went to the Lord by Shadjaraja, the Arhata Tathagata, the unexcelled, perfectly enlightened one, and having approached him, bowed down at his feet, circumambulated him to the right three times and withdrew to one side. He then asked the Lord, I have heard of a Dharma worship which surpasses all other worship. What is this Dharma worship? The Tathagata by Shadjaraja said, Noble son, Dharma worship is that worship rendered to the discourses taught by the Tathagata, the sutras. These discourses are deep and profound in illumination. They do not conform to the mundane and are difficult to understand and difficult to see and difficult to realize. They are subtle, precise, and ultimately incomprehensible. As sutras, they are collected in the canon of the bodhisattvas, stamped with the insignia of the king of incantations and teachings, they reveal the irreversible wheel of dharma arising from the six transcendences, cleansed of any false notions. They are endowed with all the aids to enlightenment and embody the seven factors of enlightenment. They introduce living beings to the great compassion and teach them the great love. They eliminate all the convictions of the maras, devils, and they manifest relativity. They contain the message of selflessness, living beinglessness, lifelessness, personlessness, voidness, signless, wishlessness, non-performance, non-production, and non-occurrence. They make possible the attainment of the seat of enlightenment and set in motion the wheel of the Dharma. They are approved and praised by the chief of the gods, Nagas, the gods, 
dragons, goblins, fairies, anti-gods, birdmen, kinnaras, centaurs, and Mahoragad's great serpents. They preserve unbroken the heritage of the Holy Dharma, contain the treasury of the Dharma, and present, represent the summit of the Dharma worship. They are upheld by all holy beings and teach all the bodhisattva practices. They induce the unmistaken understanding of the Dharma in its ultimate sense. They bring emancipation through teaching the epitomies of the Dharma, the impermanence, misery, selflessness, and peace of all things. They cause the abandonment of avarice, immorality, malice, laziness, forgetfulness, foolishness, and jealousy, as well as bad conviction and adherence to objects and all opposition. They are praised by all the Buddhas. They are the medicines for the tendencies of mundane life, and they authentically manifest the great happiness of liberation. To teach correctly, to uphold, to investigate, and to understand such sutras thus incorporated into one's own life, the holy dharma, that is the Dharma worship. Furthermore, noble son, the Dharma worship consists of determining the Dharma according to the Dharma, applying the Dharma according to the Dharma, being in harmony with relativity, being free of extremist convictions, attaining the tolerance of ultimate birthlessness and non-occurrence of all things, realizing selflessness and living beinglessness, refraining from struggle about causes and conditions without quarreling or disputing, not being possessive, being free of egoism, relying on the meaning and not on the literal expression, relying on gnostic intuition and not on consciousness, relating the dualistic consciousness, relying on the ultimate teachings definitive in meaning, and not insisting on the superficial teachings interpretable in meaning, relying on reality and not insisting on opinions derived from personal authorities, realizing correctly the reality of the Buddha, realizing the ultimate absence of any fundamental consciousness, and overcoming the habit of clinging to an ultimate ground, finally attaining peace by stopping everything from ignorance to old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, misery, anxiety, and trouble, and realizing that living beings know no end to their views concerning these 12 links of dependent origination, then, noble son, when you do not hold any view at all, it is called the unexcelled dharma worship. King of gods, when the Prince Chandra Chatra had heard this definition of dharma worship from the Tathagata Bhaisadjaraja, he attained the conformative tolerance of ultimate birthlessness, and taking his robes and ornaments, he offered them to the Buddha by Shajaraja, saying, when the Tathagata will be in ultimate liberation, I wish to defend his holy dharma, to protect it and to worship it. May the Tathagata grant me his supernormal blessing that I may be able to conquer Mara and all adversaries and to incorporate in all my lives the holy dharma of the Buddha. The Tathagata by Shajaraja, knowing the high resolve of Chandra Chatra, prophesied to him that he would be at later time in the future the protector, guardian, and defender of the city of the Holy Dharma. Then, King of Gods, the Prince Chandra Chatra, out of his great faith in the Tathagata, left the household life in order to enter the homeless life of a monk, and having a mendicant, and having done so, lived making great efforts toward the attainment of virtue. Having made great effort and being well established in virtue, he soon produced the five super knowledges, understood the, understood the incantations, and obtained the invincible eloquence. When the Tathagata by Shajaraja attained ultimate liberation, Chandra Chatra, on the strength of his super knowledges and by the power of his incantations, made the wheel of the Dharma turn just as the Tathagata by Shajaraja had done and continued to do so for ten short aeons. King of gods, while the monk Chandra Chatra was exerting himself thus to protect the holy dharma, thousands of millions of living beings reached the stage of irreversibility on the path to unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Fourteen billion living beings were disciplined in the vehicles of the disciples and solitary sages, and innumerable living beings took rebirth in the human and heavenly realms. Perhaps, King of Gods, you are wondering on ex or experiencing some doubt about whether or not at that further time the King Ratnachatra was not some other than the actual Tathagata Ratnarchihis. You must not imagine that, for the present Tathagata Ratnarchihis was at that time in that epoch the universal monarch Ratnachatra. 
As for the thousand sons of the king Radnachatra, they are now the thousand bodhisattvas of the present blessed aeon, during the course of which they are to become all of the one thousand Buddhas to appear in the world, in this world. Four of them, Krakuchanda and the others, have already appeared, and the rest are still to be born. They start from Krakuchanda and end with the Tathagata Rocha, who will be the last to be born. Perhaps, King of Gods, you are asking yourself if in that life, in that time, the Prince Chandra Chatra, who upheld the Holy Dharma of Lord Tathagata by Shadjaraja, was not someone other than myself. But you must not imagine that, for I was in that life, in that time, the Prince Chandra Chatra. Thus it is necessary to know, King of Gods, that among all the worships rendered to the Tathagata, Dharma worship is the very best. Yes, it is good eminent, excellent, perfect, supreme, and unexcelled. And therefore, king of gods, do not worship me with material objects, but worship me with dharma worship. Do not honor me with material objects, but honor me, but honor to the dharma. Then the Lord, by honor to the dharma. Then the Lord Shakyamuni said to the Bodhisattva Maitreya, the great spiritual hero, quote, I transmit to you, Maitreya, this unexcelled perfect enlightenment which I attained only after innumerable millions of billions of aeons, in order that at a later time during a later life a similar teaching of the Dharma protected by your supernatural power will spread in the world and will not disappear. Why, Maitreya, in the future there will be noble sons and daughters, gods, dragons, goblins, fairies, and anti-gods, who, having planted the roots of goodness, will conceive the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment. If they do not hear this teaching of the Dharma, they will certainly lose boundless advantages and even perish. But if they hear such a teaching, they will rejoice, will believe, and will accept it upon the crowns of their heads. Hence, in order to protect those future noble sons and daughters, you must spread a teaching such as this. Maitreya, there are two gestures of the bodhisattvas. What are they? The first gesture is to believe in all sorts of phrases and words, and the second gesture is to penetrate exactly the profound principle of the Dharma without being afraid. Such are the two gestures of the bodhisattvas. Maitreya, it must be known that the bodhisattvas who believe in all sorts of words and phrases and apply themselves accordingly are beginners and not experienced in religious practice. But the bodhisattvas who read here in spiritual practice, but the bodhisattvas who read here believe and teach this profound teaching with its impeccable expressions, reconciling dichotomies and its analysis of stages of development, these are veterans in the religious practice. Maitreya, there are two reasons the beginner bodhisattvas hurt themselves and do not concentrate on the profound dharma. What are they? Hearing this profound teaching never before heard, they are terrified and doubtful, do not rejoice and reject it, thinking, whence comes this teaching never before heard? They then behold other noble sons accepting, becoming vessels for, and teaching this profound teaching, and you do not attend upon them, do not befriend them, do not respect them, and do not honor them, and eventually they go so far as to criticize them. These are the two reasons the beginner bodhisattvas hurt themselves and do not penetrate the profound dharma. And there are two reasons the bodhisattvas who do aspire to the profound dharma hurt themselves. Or these are, oh no, there are two reasons the bodhisattvas who do, not, who do aspire to the profound dharma hurt themselves and do not attain the tolerance of the ultimate birthlessness of things. What are these two? These bodhisattvas despise and reproach the beginner bodhisattvas who have not been practicing for a long time, and they do not initiate them or instruct them in the profound teaching. Having no great respect for this profound teaching, they are not careful about its rules. They help living beings by means of material gifts and do not help them by means of the gift of the Dharma. Such, Maitreya, are the two reasons the bodhisattvas who aspire to the profound Dharma hurt themselves and will not quickly attain the tolerance of the ultimate birthlessness of all things. Having been thus taught, the Bodhisattva Maitreya said to the Buddha, Blessed one, the beautiful teachings of the Tathagata are wonderful and truly excellent. Blessed one, from this time forth I will avoid all such errors and will defend and uphold this attainment of unexcelled perfect enlightenment by the Tathagata during innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of aeons. In the future I will place in the hands of noble sons and noble daughters who are worthy vessels of the holy Dharma this profound teaching. 
I will instill in them the power of memory with which they may, having believed in this teaching, retain it, recite it, penetrate its depths, teach it, propagate it, write it down, and proclaim it extensively to others. Thus I will instruct them, Lord, and thus it may be known that in that future time, those who believe in this teaching and who enter deeply into it will be sustained by the supernatural blessing of the Bodhisattva Maitreya. Thereupon the Buddha gave his approval to the Bodhisattva Maitreya. Excellent, excellent, your word is well given. The Tathagata rejoices and commends your good promise. Then all the Bodhisattvas said together in one voice, Lord, we also, after the ultimate liberation of the Tathagata, will come from our various Buddha fields and Buddha verses to spread far and wide this enlightenment of the perfect Buddhas, the Tathagata. May all noble sons and daughters believe in that. Then the four Maharajas, the great kings of the quarters, said to the Buddha, that's Santa Claus and all the gods in the North Pole, said to the Buddha, gods of wealth and music and joy and so forth, Lord, or blessed one, in all the towns, villages, cities, kingdoms, and palaces, wherever this discourse of the Dharma will be practiced, upheld, and correctly taught, we, the four great kings, will go there with our armies, our young warriors, and our retinues to hear the Dharma, and we will protect the teachers of this Dharma for a radius of one league, so that no one who plots injury or disruption against these teachers will have any opportunity to do them harm. And the Buddha said to the Venerable Ananda, Receive then, Ananda, this expression of the teaching of the Dharma. Remember it and teach it widely and correctly to others. Ananda, because he has to memorize everything Buddha says, or anybody says somehow, memorize whatever Vimalakirti said too. Ananda replied, I have memorized, Lord, this expression of the teaching of the Dharma. But what is the name of this teaching and how should I remember it? The Buddha said, Ananda, this exposition of the Dharma is called the teaching of Himalakirti or the reconciliation of dichotomies or even section of the inconceivable liberation. Remember it thus. So that's where it connects to the, to the uh, inconceivable liberation, which is to say the Flower Ornament Sutra. Thus spoke the Buddha. And the Vilichavi Vimalakirti, the Crown Prince Manjushri, the Venerable Ananda, the Bodhisattvas, the Great Disciples, the entire multitude, and the whole universe with its gods, humans, us, uh, anti-gods, and fairies, rejoiced exceedingly. All heartily praise these declarations by the blessed Bhagavan Buddha. This completes the Noble Mahayana Sutra, the teaching of Vimalakirti, it has 1,800 shlokas and six fascicles, that's the Sanskrit version, and was translated, edited, and established in Tibetan by the monk Chunyi Tsuchim, and, ed, and translated, edited, and established by the professor Bob Thurman, Tenzin Bob Thurman, temporarily to be re-edited more and retranslated and re-established by same. And, and having done this, we dedicate the merit, having read this, we dedicate the merit to everyone becoming quickly Vimalakirti, like Vimalakirti, like the Tathagata Akshobhya, so that they might be able to help all other beings become bodhisattvas and then also Buddhas equal to Tathagata Akshobhya as soon as possible, but wasting no time, but t also taking up all the infant time might be required in any particular infinite case. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama always said, you know, as long as there are beings, the space full of living beings are not free of suffering, I also will be reborn to help them become so free of suffering. His one famous verse that he always recites all the time. May, may that be so. May we always be there to help him and May we also be do that on, in our own right in all infinite other universes as well for the sake of all beings to receive their help when they become just like us. Okay? Om Mani Peme Hum Om Bil Malakirti Om Ahri Vimalakirti Hum Peh